And thank you so much, Elan, and thank you, Anne Katrin. Um, I've already learned so much uh, in the interesting papers you've given, and I hope I can contribute a little. Um, so in 1921-22, a major exhibition was held at the Metropolitan Museum in New York and the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., of the modern woman's role in shaping photography from the 1920s to the 1950s. The central figure in the exhibition was the new woman, representing an ideal of emancipated and uh, fashionable icon of modernity, whose images captured changes in society throughout the first half of the 20th century. The exhibition introduced the work of women artists at high profile institutions, and an accompanying catalog presented several fields related to the new woman's position as a pioneer image maker. Yet through the lens of the new woman as a global phenomenon, the exhibition also brought to light a reluctance to address cultural and regional nuances in favor of the modern woman as a universalizing framework. The exhibition's approach thus pointed to a problem in the way photography's social histories are still being told, either as a generalized global practice shaped by developments in Western Europe and the United States, or as a series of outtakes shaped by regional particularities and exceptional master photographers. My paper today, outlining the start of a new research project, I should add, um, proposes a critical intervention into understanding women's contributions to Central European photography as a wide-ranging artistic and social practice from the late 1920s until the 1950s. As you see, I've slightly changed my dates already. The photographic activities of women such as Irena Bluhova, Edith Tudor Hart, and Friedel Dika Brandeis were connected with art, pedagogy, and activism. They related to art world institutions such as the Bauhaus, yet they were also embedded in collaborative social and political networks, including the Left Front um, and photo photography clubs such as Sociophoto, which emphasized sociographic rather than artistic documentation. As these different activities highlight, retrieving women's contribution to photography requires analysis beyond the focus on individuals or the work produced at specific institutions to reflect the dynamic and interconnected ways the work engaged different photographic genres. This extends a consideration of art photography at the nexus of, at the nexus of activism and pedagogy. Suppose we assess women's activities in line with these different fields of photography. In that case, it may be possible to establish a new history of photography that is less biased in terms of gender and sexuality as aspects that often predetermined the fields of photography to which women could contribute. Women photographers have been central to keeping an acute eye on social changes in the 20th century. In literature about women's emancipation after the First World War, the figure of the new woman and her relations to dance and fashion photography, for example, is a recurring topic of research. Yet there, there are also other lenses through which to consider women's increased agency and independence. The work of activists and social documentarians who use the camera as a weapon. The exclusion from wider critical frameworks is representative of a broader lack of focus on educational, social, non-professional or unofficial environments which obscure women's wide-ranging contribution to photography history. Um, in one way or another, this is the case for all the photographers I briefly introduced today. So Blühova tends to uh, feature in relation to her studies at the Dessau Bauhaus, where her previously autodidact practice adopted some of the defining features of new vision photography, including dynamic viewpoints, tight cropping, and a focus on unusual details and angles. Her later career as an activist social photographer involved in the founding of photo clubs, a publishing house and a bookshop, as well as her engagement with Czechoslovakia's marginalized populations. I should have added uh, she was born in what is uh, Slovakia today, um, tends to be framed throughout what we may call the Bauhaus lens. Despite her relatively short period of study at the school, uh, 1932, 19, or 1931 to 19, early 1933. It is her role as a Bauhaus woman that appears to mark her career trajectory from amateur to artist activist. 
A similar trajectory in some way is also visible in the case of uh, Tudor Hart and Dika Brandeis. Dika Brandeis, which I know many of you are very familiar with, um, was born in Vienna um, and she was one of the first international students at the Weimar Bauhaus and later took on some teaching capacities at the school before embarking on a successful career as an interior designer and art pedagogue. Much of her work has been lost and what is left is straddled between interpretations of her multifaceted practice relating to her teachers Franz Cizek and Johannes Itten, her activist collages and her dedication to children's art pedagogy, especially during her internment at the Theresien or Theresienstadt ghetto before she was murdered in Auschwitz in 1944. Her activist photo collages, a rare example of direct activist artistic engagement in interwar Austria, have only been document documented fragmentarily and despite Dika Brandes' international connections, have only tentatively been set in a wider context outside the Vienna Bauhaus paradigm. Tudor Hart, also born in Vienna, left the Bauhaus in solidarity with the school's director Hannes Meyer, who was fired in 1928 for his pro-communist stance. Already a trained Montessori teacher, she returned to Vienna and worked as a photographer for different illustrated magazines next to also teaching. In 1934, she emigrated to the United Kingdom, where she continued to work as a communist agent and a social photographer, documenting the lives of children in London's impoverished communities. While Tudor Hart, like Dika Brandeis, has been uh, the subject uh, of more, one or more traveling monographic exhibitions, the above named photographers overall have been slotted into broader histories of photography in Central Europe, rather than asking how the activities meeting at the nexus of modernist art education, leftist activism and pedagogy might be understood as a point of departure for alternative connected histories of photography in the region. Um, indeed, Blühova, Dika Brandes and Karas all tend to feature uh, in histories of socially engaged work in Central Europe and its links to the Bauhaus, while individual monographs stress the multifaceted nature of the work and its entanglements with avant-garde culture in Czechoslovakia, uh, the Soviet Union and Weimar Germany, just to name a few. In order to construct these narratives, the main tendency is to move from what we may recognize as artistic centers, the Bauhaus and avant-garde photographic practices by male masters, to the peripheries, at once defining Central Europe as a marginal space and the rural or suburban locations in which these photographers work with a focus on documentary work, teaching and reportage. At this point, I would like to include another photographer associated with the Bauhaus outside the Bauhaus context, Lucia Moholy. Focusing on Moholy's photographic work at the feminist agricultural commune Schwarzerden in Germany, Jordan Treller has argued, and I quote, for the revalorization of a kind of feminized photographic labor that was systematically negated at the Bauhaus, and as such an oblique commentary on the gendered nature of avant-garde discourse in the 1920s, end of quote. Partly this relates to Moholy's contributions to Bauhaus photography being erased for a long time, based on her work being perceived as a support function to that of her well-known husband, the Bauhaus master Laszlo moholy Notch. However, Treller suggests that Moholy's long-standing exclusion from avant-garde narratives is also due to the very nature of her photographic work, intimate portraits documentary Im and documentary images addressing, and I quote again, the false premise that there exist certain forms of visual representation that merely transcribe the world as it already is, end of quotes. Treller thus, uh, Treller thus interprets Moholy's photos of the Schwarzerden commune as a modernist form of photography embracing realism and the medium's reproductive functions as a challenge to avant-garde claims of originality. Even though the three photographers I focus on today were concerned with a different kind of documentary practice, a similar argument could also be made about their work. In line with Blühover's memory of the Bauhaus, and I quote, as a school that created humans for becoming human, end of quote, their work built a strong sense of social engagement, acting against the dehumanizing effects of fascism and capitalism that they were combating. Artistic experiment, experimentation and originality were secondary to a practice in which the human stood at the center. 
In this sense, their photographs also challenge the gendered principles of avant-garde experimentation while still aspiring to represent good modern photography. The very nature of these women's other activities fundamentally impacted their photographic practice. This begins with the way their photographs constructed narratives. Rather than individual artworks, for example, photographic series and reportages were an important aspect of their work, offering a multiplicity of viewpoints rather than a focus on singular individuals. Bluhova, for example, began to work in cycles as a young activist for the Czechoslovak Communist Party, and she produced numerous series that aimed to trace the living conditions of children in the peripheries. The cycle Children and Child Labor, for example, chronicles young children's work in eastern Czechoslovakia's rural areas in the mid-1920s. Representing a striking mixture of reportage and ethnographic documentation, these images play with different registers of modernist and documentary photography to forge a body of work that emphasizes both its formal adherence to contemporary practices and its socially concerned content. The youngest cowherd, which you see to your very right, I think, um, shows two young children looking after a small herd of bathing cows. The picture plane is horizontally di divided between land and water, and the two children, together with the cows, form the focus of a triangular composition. Shot from a slightly raised position, the little girl at the image front is out of focus, adding a sense of movement. The photograph has been cropped, suggesting that it has been produced with strict attention to compositional conventions, as they were advertised in contemporary photography magazines. Even though the image does not contain any elements that would position it as a contemporary photograph, by which I mean um, it frames the rural setting as a kind of timeless um, setting, the way the scene is captured with the blurred foreground and the diagonal positional of the children implies it to be a modern photograph in form. In this sense, um, we might interpret this um, as Bluhova presenting us with a subjective realistic viewpoint in which form and composition emphasize content. Her photographs underline uh, her work's human sensitive focus, which subtly points towards the poverty she records, neither idealizing nor heroicizing her young subjects. Even though image cycles such as this one were predominantly framed as activist work by the photographer herself, produced for documentation of rural poverty, um, uh, which would be used by the Communist Party in parliamentary discussions, for example, the longer trajectory of Bluhova's practice and its main points of focus, um, in, in that light, their significance also shifts from her broader leftist political engagement to particular attention towards the most vulnerable groups of society, such as children, ethnic minorities, and the disabled. Simply positioning Bluhova's work as a part of social photography, a practice often associated with Slovak interwar photography specifically, also does not quite do it justice. Frequently named comparisons share the same geography as Bluhova's work and a broader concern for the documentation of rural poverty. However, how this is done and what is depicted is quite different. One example of this is Karol Aufricht, a photographer whose work is often mentioned adjacent to Bluhova's in the context of Slovak photography. Uh, and they also work together um, in an organization called Sociophoto, which uh, Bluhova co-founded. His works uh, true cover a similar topography of poverty as Bluhova's, and the two were both active, as I've already said, in sociophotographic photography uh, such as Sociophoto, and even collaborated on photographic cycles for the exhibition, um, which occasionally they would also uh, exhibit anonymously or under the name of Sociophoto, so not, not naming individuals. And yet, Aufricht takes a different approach to his subjects. Children, like adults, are often depicted as at a distance and in profile, their faces frequently obscured. While this means that the anonymity of the subject is preserved, it also renders the documented more easily as types and emphasizes a distance between the photographer and the photographed. Thus, Bluhova's photographs display a closer connection to the people she photographed, indicating that she was permitted to enter their personal space and interact with them. 
that questions of gender played a role in these different depictions might not be immediately evident from the photographs. However, documents of social activists from the time indicate that the work of men and women activists uh, in those sort of circles were indeed perceived differently by the communities they visited and gave them different insights. For example, the Hungarian sociologist Viola Tomori noted that women were often closer to marginalized social and ethnic groups because they would engage differently in communal activities, such as mending and childcare, for example. Men's involvement tended to be limited uh, to more distanced official activities. In other words, women's entrenched social roles bore the potential to bridge a gap between city and photographer village and activist, thus allowing different insights. Sociologist Jennifer Bronson has drawn attention to the fact, uh, and this is a quote again, that research on social movements focuses on male experiences or does not use a gendered approach in its analysis. The experience of female activists, their, motiva their motivations and reasons for becoming involved in political action often differ from men, end of quote. By extension, this gender difference uh, could also be considered when assessing social photographs, through which photographers often held multiple positions as ar activists, artists, documentarians, and ethnographers. The difference between Aufricht and Blühuber's work not only points towards different framings of social documentary based on gender, among other things, but also opens up the possibility of interpretation beyond similar geographical locations and local networks. This is where the work of the other above-mentioned photographers comes into play. If we compare Blühuber's work to Tudor Hearts, for example, we find a different geography, but a similar concern with families and young children's living conditions, merging activism and social engagement, including contributions to leftist illustrated publications such as Der Kuckuck and social reportages like Marjorie Spring Rice's Working Class Wives from 1938, to the hearts, images also set women and children in focus. Not only that, the depiction of her subjects shows a similar approach to Blühuvas in, the, in that they do not only re reveal impoverished living conditions at the margins of society, but they also preserve the humans at the center of these images who often confront viewers straight on. Children proudly pose and show their games to the photographer, for example. Significantly, too, Tudor Hart's contributions to the Kukuk were not limited to photographs. She also wrote some of her own texts describing the poverty she witnessed in places such as the Caledonia Market in London, for example, or child poverty in Whitechapel. Modernist image compositions, such as the photo of old pipes sold or old boots and shoes hanging on washing lines at Caledonia Market, use visual techniques of the new objectivity photography to emphasize the market atmosphere. They resemble Bluhuva's application of similar techniques from market fairs in Slovakia in images such as gingerbread and toys. Further overlaps in the photographer's work can also be found in their publishing activities. While to the heart, as now I've already mentioned two times, uh, contributed to the Kuckuck, Blühuber started to work as a distributor for the German Arbeiter Illustrated Zeitung at the Bauhaus in Dessau, and later worked at the publishing company Runge and Company in Liberetz, um, where the Arbeiter Illustrated Zeitung was printed um, after it was forced into exile to Czechoslovakia, before, opening, before she opened her own bookshop in Bratislava in 1933, which was supported by the Comintern. Thus, aside from producing a body of documentary work that had a propagandistic as well as a sociographic focus, Blühuber and Tudor Hart's photographic practice was also tied to leftist publishing activities, which in turn supported their activities as agents and resistance fighters during the Second World War. Considering their photographic practice simply as social photography with a tendency to modernist experimentation based on their years of study at the Bauhaus does not quite cover the breadth of scope of their work. Instead, their work encompasses a much wider practice in which photographic activities are bound up with breadwork, care work, and social and political activism. These interconnected activities are also visible in the works of um, these photographers, exemplified um, in a photo montage by Friedel Dicker Brandeis, uh, loosely translated as, this is how it looks like my child, this world, 
uh, which was most likely produced as a teaching board for the Marxist Worker School that was founded in Vienna in the early 1930s and which was uh, shown in the Dicker Brandes uh, exhibition not too long ago in Vienna. Um, the spiral of bitter poverty, fascism, and a predetermined division of those born to shear and those born to be sure imply cause and effect relations of capitalism and fascism with symbolically charged images. Though appearing chaotic at first sight, each image selected was charged with symbols that help in laying out complex political and economic processes for um, a broader audience that was presumably to be taught, underlined through leftist political framing in the image text combination. In addition, with images that had already appeared in magazines that circulated by the thousands, many of the individual components of the montage included a degree of recognizability based on a political network linking artists, source materials, and viewers. Set to the right of the uniformed motorcyclists, to the heart's unemployed family, draws a direct visual connection to Viennese social photography. By embedding that by embedding that scene into a broader context using montage techniques, Dicker Brandeis' use of photos created as leftist propaganda draws, or, or teaching, you could say, uh, draws a connection to a wider network of interwar activist photography, which also moves us beyond the printed image. Um, Duncan Forbes has suggested this, that Unemployed Family had not been published at the time that Dicker Brandeis produced the photo montage. Adding to this the fact uh, that both women were members of Austria's Communist Party, lived in the same building for a short while, and were both involved in some way uh, in, in activities surrounding Montessori teaching. Um, uh, Dika Brandes as a designer and Tudor Hart as a teacher. This points towards a network of collaboration linked through activism, pedagogy, and social engagement. A similarly close collaboration is also evident, uh, so we're jumping back to Czechoslovakia or Hungary and the Bauhaus in a way. Um, a similarly close collaboration is also evident from the connections between Blühova and the Hungarian photographer Judith Karas. The two met at the Bauhaus and after returning to Central Europe would work for similar social photography ex organizations such as Charlo, uh, which translates to Sickle, and um, they would reference titles of each other's exhibitions while also maintaining a personal friendship that would last until the 1970s. Um, drawn all these very broad connections uh, together in a first attempt, um, these preliminary connections point towards a history of photography that built on collaboration, which has remained largely invisible by a focus on individuals and specific photographic genres. Central Europe's activist women photographers merged commitments to solidarity and modernist artistic production, including monumental worker photos, photo reports, and the most radical tool of photo activism, photo montage. Making use of different opportunities open to them with the primary aim of giving voice to society's most disadvantaged, their work represents an international network of engaged photography that emphasizes an em empathic, empathetic worldview. Setting their work in focus ultimately constructs a, an alternative history of photography which shifts the gaze towards a more pluralistic view of 20th century society in Central Europe. In this way, new spaces for political engagement, activism and sociality come into focus and make visible women's contributions to the histories of social, technological, activist, and pedagogical networks to which photography is intrinsically related. Thank you.